Hi, I'm uh, KP Powell. Uh, I'm an actor who lives in Atlanta. I'm back at the Blackfriars Playhouse after a two year hiatus and I'm playing Moses in Passover. Hey, my name is Christopher Burris. Um, I'm from Brooklyn, New York, uh, and I am directing uh, Passover here um, at the American Shakespeare Center. This is my first time here. Um, I've been working primarily as an independent um, director, freelance, all over for the last like 10 or so years. So, thrilled to be here um, at the Blackfriars. What drew me to Passover um, when I got the offer was simply that it scared me. Um, that that it, it, it's, the play itself isn't that heavy, but everything it talks about and brings up is. And so I was scared to, because especially right now, for the past, eight years or so, everybody has wanted to avoid or simplify every nuance of disagreement, discussion, problems, problematic issues. And so every woman's issue, queer issue, black issue, Asian issue, any, everything becomes so black and white that we miss the nuance because nuance involves being vulnerable and talking about your own personal experiences in this country. And to do so is to admit that you might have caused harm to others or that you have your own harm that you're ignoring. And so to be in a play like that demands so much of me as a person that it scared me. And that's why I was like, well, I want to do it then. I, wanted, I want to go through that journey so that an audience doesn't have to. They can just be in the little dinghy boat as I pull them along through the dam and let it all like surround me. And so... That's what drew me to it, and it's still scary. Um, I'm always honored um, to sit at the head of the table when it comes to telling a story that intersects with my experience as a black man in America. Um, I think that um, it's a part of, uh, it's a necessary part of um, healing. And therefore, like any time I get an opportunity, um, I, I jump at it, especially when there's an opportunity um, to bring it into a new space in this way. You know what I mean? Like the, the opportunity to offer like a new sort of conversation, which is a big part of why they wanted to do Passover here, you know, like very intentionally. So, um, but I'm always, always grateful for an opportunity to tell the stories about the people who paved the way for me. Besides like the plot synopsis, Passover is about um, is it possible in a world without agency to take control of your own life, to be able to find a way to escape the circumstances that are oppressing you, whether that oppression is metaphorical, physical, psychological, no matter how it exists, without agency, how is one supposed to find a way to escape? Passover is a meditation on the destruction of black bodies in America. Um, that has been a part of our experience since we got here. Um, and though it has, the look of it has changed, um, one thing that's true is that there is a, there is a war <laughs> um, against our bodies. And so uh, Passover is an opportunity for us to come together and to see where we are. Um, and to see what steps we need to take in order to finally change that narrative. Just having everything equally lit the whole time, like there's no, there's not going to be any up, down, spotlighting, sound, uh, canned sound effects. There might be some others, but without all those bells and whistles, this place the beauty of this place, why I always come back to this place, especially for classics, is that it's always demanding that you be enough. That it's like, no, use your imagination to make me see the thing I don't. Don't pump in the sounds of thunder so that I go, oh, okay, thank you. Like, make me believe you're in a storm. And so to be in this place of like a, an actual, like, uh, existential crisis made real, to be in that kind of place, this this space demands will make me believe it make me believe that you're trapped in one spot and can't go anywhere else 
when I can see every exit in the building at all times. Mm -hmm. Like it, like make me forget about everything else. I, I, I was having sort of a, an existential crisis before um, coming here and, and it, it, not really, it was artistic. <laughs> um, but I, I, I was, uh, I, I was directing um, a play down in North Carolina, and I remember saying and talking about how the play was a language play. And then, like, I froze because I was like, you know what? I feel like I say this a lot. You know what? Maybe every play is a language play. Like, maybe every single play is a language play. And therefore, by coming in and sitting at the table saying, this is a language play, I'm actually not doing anything. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I'm a fraud. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, but but I do uh, realize that um, there's a distinct line between me as an artist and um, working in spaces where the language is the star, you know? The very first play I directed um, in undergrad, I remember one of the professors came um, right before, a couple of days before we opened, and he said to the cast, he was like, you know, Christopher's directed this play, like, and I remember being like, what is, you know, like, what is that? Like, what, you know, like. You made it a visual play instead of a language play. That's what he was saying. What he was saying was that I, I yeah, like, like, was like, I, I focused the energy and the attention so that it was like, no, this is where you, this is where it is. You know what I mean? Um, and so to, to come to a place where like, that's what it, that's it. It's all, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's there, and either you find a way to make it um, pr uh, alive in the present moment, and you find a way to make it um, 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 fresh and new right then and there, or you don't. <laughs> and if you don't, there's nothing that's gonna come in and say, you know what I mean? There's nothing that's gonna drop yeah. the audience in. So. There's no phantom chandelier to be like, well, at least that was Oh, <laughs> oh, you know, look at that helicopter. But, um, and the fact that the audience here comes with that expectation, like this is an audience who has, who has seasoned and practiced in the art of um, experiencing a language play. Because this is how growth actually occurs, right? Like if we think about our, our souls, our bodies, our, our minds, whatever thing you use to get yourself through the day, the thing that you need in order to grow that part of yourself is to have hard conversations you don't want to have. Um, whether it's a marriage, your parents, your brothers and sisters, family, friends, anything, the, the only reason you're as close to those people as you are is because there was a moment of crisis where the both of you didn't run away. The both of you turned to it and said, well, let's deal with this moment now. And that belt built a trust and a growth. Even if there was disagreement, there built an understanding of you allowed me to share me with you, right? Not parts of me that I thought you wanted, my actual self I shared. You care of the kid. <laughs> and so, right, when you have, a, when you have plays like this, like that, ask really really hard questions and make a, and take specific moments that you might disagree with and say but this still happens how do you feel about it talk to someone um that's where growth occurs like we always want to just turn away from something but the only way the plant grows is you have to put it in the sunlight you have to shed light on it and this play sheds light on a couple of really specific things that are inherent in american culture that we tend to just not look to and then we expect growth and that doesn't happen, and, and, so, and so that's why. That's why I think people should see this play, is to grow, yeah. if you're interested in growth. If you're not, then don't come. Don't be mad, like, you asked hard questions. Yes, but if you are like, no, I want the challenge, then come sit through something that's challenging. Absolutely. I mean, um, it's gonna be an uncomfortable experience, but it's gonna be an experience that is um, going to, I hope um, necessarily change the energy of the community in a way um, that the experience is going to allow for energy to be able to shift and to move so that collectively we leave different than when we came in.
I, I think that they should see this play because it's going to be an opportunity to help move not just um, the folks in the theater, not just the folks right outside on the street, but what sort of impact can the folks who experience the story, and then once they take whatever um, is released and they go back out, like what kind of impact can that have? I believe that this play, along with um, many other um, works of art, has the potential to really um, move the conversation forward, but also to move personal stuckness. You know what I mean? So I think that there's very few opportunities to really come as a community and know that you're going to be challenged and know that you're going to be um, in a position where you're gonna have to deal with something that you know that something is gonna come up at some point that's gonna need to be dealt with. So, um, while in the view of everyone else, while while everyone else is looking like, at not you. the private like I'm watching Twelve Years a Slave, Passion of the Christ, or any of those things in a theater where I could be like, well, it's dark. It's like, well, if I'm sobbing now, hi, yeah, it's happening, yeah. But it's also that reminder that we're t we're in it together. Yeah. Like, I mean. We, we, the, we, the problems didn't occur <laughs> because of one person, right? <laughs> so the solutions aren't gonna occur because of one person. And ultimately we need each other in order to heal, in order, to, in order for things to get better. So I feel like it's that reminder of it as well, you know, like they're watching me have my experience and I get to watch them have their experience. And that's a part of it, you know? You know there's gonna be a lot of F-bombs in this show. Like if that bothers you, still come and see it, but just prepare your ear of like, all right, they're about to drop a lot of F-bombs and N-bombs. So just, but that's part of the story trying to say, though there's people who speak like this. Let's see, let's watch a story about them. Not every story can be about a, like a Bridgerton rich families trying to find love in the garden. Right, some come from other people. And I love that this story doesn't try to make the character special. It's saying every human is special in and of themselves. Whether you agree with them, like them or, or not, they are who they are. And so I'm saying that because I do want people to come see it, even if people who typically don't like foul language. It's like, well, please come anyway, so that you can see a person who speaks foul language try to figure out life just like you try. You know, that's the only thing I care to warn you about. There will be cursing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Also, the play is fun. Like, we keep bringing up all of the, like, emotional impacts of it. It's also funny and enjoyable and heartfelt and warming. Like, it's, it's all the things you want a story to be. But I don't need to warn you that it's gonna, like, tug at your heartstrings. That it's the full human experience. That's what we're working on crafting. And so it might be uncomfortable, it might be frustrating, but um, our hope is that it also is uh, a true reflection of the human experience.